my 10 year old SIP air compressor had suddenly started to trip the motor overload breaker after the compressor had been for a ride in the back of a lorry. Jumping to the obvious cause, being the motor start capacitor, I then had to do a bit more investigating as I think it turned out to be something entirely different. So here is what my once very reliable compressor does now. So I'll let some air out, so it's below the trigger point and then should come on. So let's have a go. She's stuttering, there's the trip and she's tripped. And then the air blow off from the cylinder. So I'll just press the reset button again. And this is the motor control box in red. But first, we'll unplug the power before we do anything else. With the power unplugged, we can now carefully remove the top cover. So with the posi drive or Phillips screwdriver, I can now remove the four screws holding this cover on. And before we discard that cover, if we have another look at that cover, we can see the two capacitors that are in this. We have a 45 microfarads, which is the running capacitor, and 150 microfarads, which is the starting capacitor, and it's protected by a 15 amp trip. So with the cover off, we can clearly see the running capacitor, which is grey on this model, and the starting capacitor, which is blue, and there's the trip in green. So I'll carefully unclip these two capacitors, being very careful not to touch the connectors on the end because these are more than likely to be fully charged and would give a very big nasty shock. So we lift them out from the back carefully. So that's the starting capacitor and that's the running capacitor. So we can look at these in more detail now. So why do we need these capacitors? Electric motors need a rotating magnetic field to start. Single phase motors have a problem here as the main supply creates a pulsating field instead which would cause the motor to sit and vibrate. To overcome this there are two motor windings, a start one and a running one. The start winding is fed by the start capacitor and when both windings are energised the motor rotates until it reaches about 70-80% to 80 speed. At which point a centrifugal switch disconnects the supply to the start winding and the motor carries on running on the main winding. So the starting capacitor is rated at 150 microfarads at 350 volts AC. With the motor having a smaller second continuously rated run capacitor it will still use that start winding but feed it via the run capacitor which effectively gives the motor a two-phase power supply and thus a smoother running motor. When the motor is switched off and comes to rest the centrifugal switch automatically closes and energises the bigger start capacitor ready to power up the next restart. The start capacitor is normally about three times the value of the run capacitor, hence 150 microfarads with a run capacitor of 45 microfarads. The start capacitor can only be in use for a short burst period, whereas the run capacitor is rated for continuous use. And the running capacitor is 45 microfarads plus or minus 5% at 450 volts AC. Some multimeters can test a capacitor by charging it with a known current then measuring the voltage result. This can then be used to calculate the value of capacitance. So we need to make sure the capacitor is discharged. Now ideally you'd connect a 20,000 ohm 5 watt resistor across the two terminals for five seconds. I'm short of one of those so I'm just going to use a pair of metal pliers and if it was charged you'd probably get a bit of a spark. Now with the capacitor discharged I'm going to use a pair of pliers here and just pop off the spade connectors. Notice I'm still paranoid that it might be charged. So we can now take it to a bench and since my multimeter has capacitance facility, I can now try that. Now I need to press the yellow button 
which is showing nanofarads but this meter is an auto ranging type so it will hopefully go to microfarads so we're looking for 150 microfarads so I'll test this a few times to see what the results are and we've got there 171 microfarads now I'm going to swap the connectors over or turn the capacitor around and do the test again 171 microfarads so this is pretty consistent third time 171 again and then for the final time we'll check it 171 microfarads so that's looking okay now for the run capacitor note this is a 45 microfarad one and it's plus or minus five percent so in this instance we are seeking a value of between 42.75 microfarads to 47.25 microfarads anything between that is a pass so we can now pop the starting capacitor back into position inside the little control box on top of the motor and then we can go on to the running capacitor now so we just pop that clip back in push that down now there's three wires on the running capacitor and one of them is connected to the trip which is the black wire there I'm just going to pull that one off like so so this one's got two connectors for each one so I'm just going to short these two out and now it should be safe I'm still paranoid you can tell you can get a big shock off those and I'm just going to use a screwdriver to pop those off I'm still not touching those connectors <laughs> even though it should be discharged now so I'm just making a note of that which way they went and we take that to the bench so same procedure as before we're looking for 45 microfarads so let's turn the multimeter on press the yellow button we're in auto range of narrow farads at the moment and what have we got 40.8 so it's a little bit below the lowest that it should be the lowest should be 42.25 we are a little bit under that yeah so this is probably on its way out it's giving us a consistent result now I'm just gonna have a look over the outside of it see if anything's bulging and it all seems straight so there may be a little bit of life left in this one so I'm just going to pop that capacitor back on although technically it's failed the test I don't believe that to be the cause of any issues because the compressor I know does actually run properly the issue is getting it to start so I was looking for the issue being on the starting capacitor but anyway so I'm going to pop the cover back on there screw that all up and I'm thinking that's a pass and there's another issue now for a word of warning I couldn't find the exact capacitor for my SIP and the ones that nearly matched were far more expensive like 40 to 50 pounds so seeing mine said CD60 on it I bought a capacitor saying CD60 for less than 10 pounds with a 50 microfarad higher capacity and a voltage of 250 volts assuming the UK mains is 230 volts so surely this might be okay well apparently it's a no 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 so this is what I bought and thankfully I did not attempt to fit it after doing a bit more investigating so that can go back in the box and sit in the cupboard if your capacitor states 350 volts then you should only replace with one of the same or higher voltage for safety and long life as to the capacitance value if I'd replaced the 150 microfarads with a 200 microfarad one 
then it would take longer to charge as it would store more energy. There is also a risk that the motor windings would be subjected to a higher than rated amperage which could shorten the motor's life. So always play safe and change like for like or get a qualified electrician to check things over first. I now decided to try and find the starting issue by eliminating things one by one. So will the motor run if I remove the drive belt to the compressor? So with the drive belt now removed, the motor doesn't have a problem. It seems to be running fine. I'll speed this part up a bit. So I'll do it again but a bit faster. No problem. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual compressor. So I think the motor's fine. So that's turning okay, it's not not too stiff or anything. So what's the problem? So then I wonder if the drive belt was too tight. So with a really slack drive belt, the motor's still clearly having an issue and pops the circuit breaker. So what else can it be, I'm thinking? That's definitely slack. So I'm thinking perhaps it's to do with the air coming out of the air compressor itself. So my thinking is to now create an air leak on the outlet from the compressor itself by loosening one of the air fittings. So I'm thinking if I remove this pipe, when the motor turns the compressor over, there shouldn't be much compression and so it should be easy to turn over and let's see if the motor can cope. And it works. Motor's happy, compressor's happy. So is the issue something to do with that brass coupling? Is something in there? Is what I'm thinking, because there is like a big nut on the end. So now I'm focusing my attention in that direction. So I then put the pipe back on, assuming the motor would stall. But it didn't, it actually carried on running like everything was fine until I came to switch it off and then I had permanent air leaking from the valve of the pressure switch. So now my attention is definitely on that brass junction piece. Something's going on inside it. There must be a valve in there. So now my attention is definitely on this valve. So I'm going to disconnect this pipe that leads to the pressure switch and yes, that's where the air is leaking from. So that's coming straight out of the air tank. So presumably there's a one-way valve in there. So as the compressor forces the air into the tank, there's a valve that cuts it back off. And look at that. It's just stopped. Something in there is not right. Could it be this simple? Time to drain that air tank and open this brass coupling up, I think. So on my air compressor, it's a 24mm spanner that's required on this coupling. Make sure you do depressurise the cylinder, because this nut head could sort of shoot off and hit you. Okay, so we've got a spring and we've got a seal. So clearly this is a one-way valve. So presumably that's been getting stuck, which is then causing the air to escape. But this only adds to my confusion because if the air was escaping, I would have heard that in the beginning. So why wasn't the compressor actually starting? Logically, that would mean that there was compressed air still in the piston cylinder, making it too hard for the motor to turn. But that aside for the moment, here's a photo showing the inside of the check valve. And we can clearly see the opening to the main tank 
and the pipe coming from the piston of the compressor. And here's a close up of that seal with the spring. And here's all the parts disassembled so that you can see what's going on in there. But this is leaving me all very puzzled. If the check valve was faulty, you'd expect a permanent air leak coming from the pressure switch, which it never did till I started tinkering with it just now. Could the pressure switch also be faulty, allowing the compressed air in the tank to backflow past the faulty check valve and into the piston cylinder, causing the motor to be trying to turn an already pressurised piston cylinder over from a standing start, causing it to draw too many amps and thus tripping the breaker. So I'll put this all back together now. Now hopefully by taking it apart it's actually resettled this valve back into the correct position because presumably it must have got nudged when the compressor was being moved and perhaps it was just got knocked out of position so hopefully by taking it all apart and then re-putting it back together the problem might be solved I just need to snug that back up now. So put the little tube on there to the pressure switch. Like I say, it's still a bit of a dilemma because I do wonder if that pressure switch is still questionable. Because in theory, if this valve was faulty, air should have continuously been leaking out of the pressure switch. And it wasn't. So there's still a little bit of a mystery here, I think. But I think I'm closer now to knowing what the issue is. And it definitely doesn't seem to be anything to do with capacitors or the motor, which is quite good. So let's try it now. Obviously, it's very dangerous with no belt guard. Seems happy as Larry. How strange. How very, very strange. Then one final check with everything back on, including that belt guard. I'd like to think I fixed it, but I still think it probably needs a new valve on there and possibly that pressure switch looking at. Thank you for watching and hope this video helped you in the maintenance of your compressor. This video was filmed and edited by me, Mark Savage. And I'm also on Instagram and Facebook under Coats and Gators.